When I see young students, you know, some of them chanting death to America, when you hear that, what does that tell you? This radical Islamist ideology uh, that has taken over so many of, of our schools. Vice President to President Trump, would you accept the job if you were offered it? I would. Come on, Tulsi, you're a smart person. You must accept President Trump is simply wrong. The election was not stolen by vote rigging. When people raise concerns around the integrity of our elections, they should not be so easily dismissed. I'm baffled why people like you seem to think it would be an inevitable thing to happen, that Putin wins. Uh, I don't think that's an accurate characterization at all. What President Biden should have done from the very beginning was broker a peace deal. If this was an attack on American soil, you would want every single inch that was taken. The feeling and the emotion is very different from the reality. Is, is Tulsi Gabbard, have you ever killed a dog? She's an adult, she's a former member of Congress. She has the opportunity to make her case to the American people. You haven't actually answered that question. Tulsi Gabbard has done it all. I'm not just talking about podcasts and the cable news circuit. She served the US Army in Iraq. She's a vegetarian. She was vice chair of the Democratic National Committee until she backed socialist Bernie Sanders over Hillary Clinton. And she later ran as a Democrat presidential candidate herself before quitting the party altogether. She's now backing Donald Trump. And many people want her to be his running mate. So is Tulsi Gabbard the across the aisles unifier that can power Trump back to the White House? All the ultimate political identity crisis. Well, she can tell me herself because Tulsi Gabbard, author of the new book, For Love of Country, joins me now. Tulsi, great to have you on Uncensored. Thank you so much. It's great to be here with you. That was quite an intro because uh, it's been quite a life. When you shut the last page of your book, what did you conclude about yourself? Uh, I, I know exactly who I am and my purpose. My purpose being to do my best to serve our country, to try to live a life that's pleasing to God and make the most impact I possibly can uh, to, have that, uh, to have that positive impact. Uh, our country, unfortunately, is in a state of crisis. We are far more divided than I've experienced in my lifetime, and we're facing both domestic and foreign policy crises. Uh, now is a time for us, and this is a message I'm carrying to voters across the country from all different political backgrounds, people who hold different positions and different views on issues, really uh, reminding us all that we've got to re remember the responsibility that our founders endowed upon us through our founding doc uh, documents and, and principles and values that we, the people, get to decide who serves in our government. And if we're not happy with the direction our, our, uh, our country is headed in, then only we can be that solution by holding leaders accountable and beginning to get our country back on track. That can only come together if we set aside our differences on some issues, but come together around the fundamental principles of freedom that define us as who we are as Americans and define our country. Tulsi, the full title of your book is For Love of Country, Leave the Democrat Party Behind. You were a very high flyer in that Democrat Party. Was there one tipping point for you in the end that, that forced your decision to leave? You know, ultimately, Piers, it came down to many, many years of unfortunately seeing how those in power in the Democratic Party were moving us in the wrong direction. When I first joined the Democratic Party, it was 2002. I was 21 years old, looking to run for a seat in our state legislature. I didn't come from a family that had uh, deep political ties to one party or another. And, and certainly our parents were not telling us as kids, I'm the fourth of five, you must follow this party or that party. And so I really took a look both in our local politics in Hawaii and our history of the Democratic Party, but also looking at some of the leaders, national leaders that, that I was inspired by, President John F. Kennedy, Reverend Martin Luther King, mm -hmm. people who to me, embodied uh, true, true leadership that was focused on, on service. And what I saw in the Democratic Party at that time, over 20 years ago, was a party that uh, celebrated free speech, that was willing to defend the free speech and civil liberties of every American, even those who they may not agree with or who they may not be aligned with politically. 
And it, it was a big tent party that welcomed people with different backgrounds, religions, ideas, and, and celebrated those kinds of conversations that take place in these, in these uh, feisty and sometimes rowdy mm. party gatherings and, and just fought for the little guy. Those are things that resonated with me very much. Uh, I am a, a strong conservationist and environmentalist, and I saw people who really cared about making sure we, we care for Mother Earth and we are uh, preserving the natural resources that we have available to us. Fast forward to where we are today, and that Democratic Party is, is wholly unrecognizable to me, and I know to a lot of Americans who feel politically homeless right now, uh, who are, are frustrated at best, angered at worst, with the kinds of policies that today's Democrat elite are pushing that are undermining our fundamental rights and freedoms, freedom of speech, freedom of expression, and are, are really uh, uh, willing to destroy our democratic republic so that they can remain in power. So it got to a point, Piers, where I, I could not align myself in any way with the political party that stood diametrically opposed to the oath that I swore both as a soldier when I enlisted and as a member of Congress to support and defend the Constitution of the United States and to defend our freedom. There are lots of divisive issues at the moment, uh, as you rightly say. One of the big ones is centred around uh, Gaza, the Israel war on Hamas following the terror attack of October the 7th, um, and in particular the way that students have protested in America uh, what do you make of what's been going on, particularly places like Colombia? Uh, when I see young students, you know, some of them chanting death to America or having Hamas or Hezbollah insignia or chanting to Jewish students from the river to the sea, knowing what that means to a Jewish ear, uh, or you know, chanting intifada when the only two intifadas in my lifetime involving uh, Palestinians and Israelis involved a lot of people dying. When you hear that, when you see that, right in the heart of America, what does that tell you? You know, it, it, is, it is a direct reflection of a failure of leadership across different administrations through both political parties to address what is at the heart of, uh, of uh, what is being manifested through these protests. There is, uh, in, in Islamist terrorist groups like Hamas, Hezbollah, ISIS, Al-Qaeda, their, their goal is to uh, wage this ideological warfare that they want to result in Islamic rule. That is the definition of radical Islamism. They want to be able to rule the world based on their Islamic rule or law. And they've been waging this, this ideological warfare for hundreds of years. This is not anything new. But when we go back to the aftermath of the terrorist attack here uh, in America on 9-11, and I remember President George Bush saying that we will defeat them militarily and ideologically, the reality is that the ideological part of that warfare never took place. Uh, the, the Islamist terrorist groups have been very consistent, strategic, and aggressive in pushing their ideology uh, around the world. Meanwhile, leaders in the West, including in America, have not. And there's two reasons for that. One is they are either intellectually incapable of making that argument, of pointing out the difference between the religion of Islam versus radical Islamism, which is, is, is a political goal and a political agenda that stands directly against freedom and civilization. And also, as we're seeing play out right now in our election here, in this 2024 presidential race where President Biden, I mean, he was silent for nine days before he spoke out on these, uh, you know, riots in some cases and protests and exactly what you explained are happening across our campuses. It took him nine days to address this to the country. And even then, as we've seen over and over, when the, these types of issues come up, he failed to directly call out uh, the cause of what we are seeing which is this radical Islamist ideology uh, that has taken over so many of, of our schools and people who claim to be standing for the Palestinian people and yet who are calling for genocide of Jewish people, calling for, as we saw in Columbia University, uh, things like they hope October 7th happens, 10,000 mm -hmm. 
times over, blocking Jewish students and faculty from being able to enter the universities where they are studying or where they they are working. And he's afraid of doing this because he, he's terrified of being called an Islamophobe. He is terrified of the pro-Hamas and the Hamas apologists that exist, some in Congress and some in different parts of the country, for going after him. And, and when you think about um, our, our president and commander-in-chief being afraid to stand unequivocally and immediately and say, we stand for free speech and we will defend everyone's right to peacefully protest, to express themselves and exercise their right and freedom of speech. We stand against anti-Semitism and we, we stand against this radical Islamist ideology that we see taking over not only what we're seeing in these campuses, but we've seen it happen, as you know, very well in different parts mm -hmm. of Europe. That's the kind of leadership we need and we are seeing um, the undermining of the rule of law, uh, uh, you know, the peace and, and order uh, completely uh, destroyed in, in so many of our communities. It comes down to these people who are in positions of power, President Biden being foremost among them, not acting with strength, being weak and, and failing to act because of fear. The um, story that got my attention this week, uh, Tulsi, which I wrote a whole column about for the New York Post, involved a guy called Andrew Duddon, who turned out to be Dud by name, Dud by nature, as I put it, who's the CEO of Hims and Hers. And he's the guy that decided last Thursday, after these extraordinary scenes where at Columbia, these students, you know, smashed their way into an historic building, uh, Hamilton Hall, and then, you know, caused merry hell, uh, breaking all sorts of laws in the process. He decided to tweet this uh, on X. Moral courage is greater than college degree. If you're currently protesting against the genocide of the Palestinian people and for your university's divestment from Israel, keep going. It's working. There are plenty of companies and CEOs eager to hire you, regardless of university discipline. And this, of course, led to a very familiar pattern uh, after he did this, where there was understandable outrage. Then the stock price of his company collapsed uh, by over 10% at one stage. And then came a groveling climb down, where he didn't actually apologise. He just sort of mealy mouthed his way through a kind of, I didn't mean what you all thought I meant, and I support peace and always have done. And that made me think, I wonder what that guy posted after October the 7th. And I went back and checked his, his feed. And he posted precisely nothing, not a word, mm. demanding peace after October the 7th. In fact, he didn't post anything for three weeks. And when he did, it was to repost Amnesty International, who were demanding an end to the genocide. So it turned out to be a very selective peace that he wanted. It, had, it didn't involve yeah. mass slaughter of uh, Israel people. That was fine. Uh, but actually, if it ever turned around that Israel responded and killed people, that was crossing a line for him. That, to me, he talked about moral courage. That is moral cowardice, isn't it? And that's an American CEO. Yes, yes, yes it's exactly that. It, it's moral cowardice, and it, it is... It is uh, a function of, of the increasing rise of anti-Semitism and the one-sided view that unfortunately too many people have as they're looking at this, uh, this conflict. This, this is something that is more than just the latest um, uh, fight between the Israeli people and the Palestinian people that has been going on for so long. The world should be taking notice of what's happening here in that this is the latest front in this war being waged by these Islamist terrorist organizations. We've seen other attacks happen in other parts of the world, obviously, uh, the Al-Qaeda's attack here on our country on 9-11. Uh, but this is a very concerted strategy that, that involves both kinetic warfare in the slaughter and, and rape and pillage of those all of those Israeli people there on October 7th, uh, again, I, I was deployed uh, with the military. I'm still in the U.S. Army Reserve. I was deployed to East Africa and Somalia, and I've seen with al-Shabaab the same kind of uh, tactics and, and uh, both kinetic and ideological warfare they are waging there. Uh, and that's really where on these, you know, when you hear the rhetoric coming from that CEO mm. and you hear the rhetoric that's coming from some of these college campuses, it completely denies the reality of, of, of who Hamas is and what their objectives are. So you have people who claim to be calling for peace, 
who claim to be acting for the well-being of the Palestinian people, Hamas is using the Palestinian people to further their own objectives. They don't care about their lives. They don't care about truly bringing about peace. Uh, if they did, there, there is a very clear path forward. Return the hostages, lay down your arms, bring about a true uh, Palestinian authority that represents the interest of the Palestinian people and peace and security that can actually begin that process of, of achieving that objective. As long as Hamas is there, whose stated goal is the extermination of Jewish people and, and uh, the destruction and elimination of the Israeli state, uh, there, to, to think that peace is possible for a terrorist organization, an Islamist terrorist organization whose goal is that, uh, is, is naive at best. You see, I agree with almost everything you just said, certainly in relation to Hamas, and I absolutely understand why Israel is so determined to eliminate Hamas and stop them redoing what they did on October 7th, which is something they've, they've stated they want to do. Um, where my concern is, and you mentioned this earlier about ideology, 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 you can take out the current Hamas terror group, 25, 30,000 terrorists, and maybe Israel will achieve this um, by steaming through Rafah, which is a massive, at the moment, a massive refugee camp albeit housing a bunch of terrorists hiding amongst the civilians as they do. But if in the process Israel kill another 10,000 civilians, which could easily happen, and you start seeing a death toll of 40,000, 50,000 Palestinians in response to a death toll of 1,200 people, is that not going to fuel the ideology which led to Hamas in the first place? Does that not concern you? Well, the, the ideology that, that leads to Hamas is, is one that, again, uh, goes, goes back hundreds and hundreds of years. And the ideology that fuels Hamas is no different from these other Islamist terrorist organizations that operate around the world. Certainly, they are taking advantage of the Palestinian people uh, and, and their plight, uh, which is why this, this, is, this is a very complex environment. Mm -hmm. Uh, even from from uh, a, a warfare standpoint, um, it, it is it is probably one of the most tough environments in the world when you have a, a terrorist organization that's using the Palestinian people to try to protect themselves, and once again not caring how many Palestinians are killed in this uh, in in this war. Uh, you know, it, it is there. It's a very very tough road ahead but it needs to be tackled on all fronts uh, and recognizing that, as you said, so long as Hamas is there, uh, the goal of peace and security is going to be very, very difficult. It's gonna be difficult no matter what. It will be impossible so long as Hamas is, is an Islamist terrorist organization that is serving as the government uh, for the people of, of Palestine. You're now a, a Donald Trump supporter. I've known Donald Trump nearly 20 years. Um, as I'm talking to you, Stormy Daniels has just been sworn in in this case in New York. Uh, again, I've written about this, and I, I feel that this case is a travesty to drag a former president of the United States through a, a criminal court in America over such a, a comparatively trivial matter. Um, I think is really a, a shameful moment for America and for the justice system. Uh, how do they get to this? How do they get to a desire to humiliate an American president in this way, do you think? You know, I, I started, I, I could not have foreseen this, but I started to see the signs of, of uh, what has led us to this place after Donald Trump won in 2016. Uh, I was in Hawaii, it was election night. Uh, you know, the, the results were announced and I thought, okay, well, I will go back to Washington in a few days. The Democrat caucus will meet in the House of Representatives. And I thought, if, you know, this could be an opportunity for party leaders to say, OK, uh, we lost badly in this election. We need to go on, on a listening tour and, and figure out what are we missing? What are we doing wrong? Uh, what, could, what could the Democratic Party have done better to reach out to those Americans, sometimes lifelong Democrats, who left the party and went and voted for Donald Trump. None of that happened. It was immediately a blame game of fingers pointing in both directions. It's somebody else's fault. 
and and their their um, uh, hysteria around Donald Trump just continued to grow and grow and grow. So that there was as long as Donald Trump's name was attached to anything, it was it was uh, it was heresy. It was something that could not stand. Actually, looking at policies or issues on substance just didn't didn't occur. And so now, when we look at why is this happening now? It's because Donald Trump is obviously the presumptive Republican nominee. And, and the dangerous thing is the Democrat elite, both those who hold office and those who don't, are so terrified that we, the American people, may make the quote unquote wrong choice in this election that they are willing to destroy our democracy in order to what they believe they are doing, which is to save the democracy save our democracy from Donald Trump. They're willing to silence our voices and limit our ability to exercise our right to vote in order to pursue this righteous cause that they believe they're on. So as you said, they're undermining the rule of law. They are weaponizing the Department of Justice. They are doing everything they possibly can to keep Donald Trump locked up in a courtroom, uh, draining him of time and resources, limiting his ability to go out and make his case to the American people uh, to, to in the hopes that they will be able to remain in power. What my message appears to, to people I talk to across the country, the message in my book is however you feel about Donald Trump, however you feel about Joe Biden, whatever party you may affiliate yourselves with, we as Americans have to take a step back in this moment and recognize this dangerous threat to who we are as a constitutional republic and a democracy. Because if we allow this to stand, then a new precedent and a new norm will be set where the next administration or the next administration after that, whoever is the party in power, they will feel justified in going after their political opponent yeah. and limiting our free speech, limiting our democracy, because, hey, the other guys did it. We should do the same. Yeah, I completely agree. It's the precedent is so extraordinary to me. I mean, yesterday, the judge in the case said that if Donald Trump speaks again outside the court in a way he doesn't like, he might jail him. And I thought, have you thought about this, Mr. Judge? If you thought about the reality of putting a very recent president of the United States into a prison cell because you don't like what he's saying about a case which most Americans think is a stitch-up. Uh, and I also thought that, actually, if he exactly. went through with it, and, and if I was Donald Trump, I'd almost be advising him now to, to, to call the guy's bluff and be put in a prison cell. I couldn't think of a better vote winner for Donald Trump than to be sent to jail for speaking his mind about a case that is so pathetic. Honestly, I couldn't. Yeah, exactly. And, and that picture would be very stark, especially when you compare it to violent criminals being let out on our streets even after being apprehended. When you compare that to, you know, the hundreds, thousands, millions of illegal immigrants streaming across our border. Uh, when, when you compare that to the resources the FBI is putting uh, forward at the direction of the Department of Justice towards investigating our fellow Americans because of, you know, they went and protested at a Board of Education meeting. It's just the, the bias is, is so brazen. The abuse of power has become so brazen. They're not even trying to hide it anymore. My hope is with my book and with everything that's happening that more Americans at least are uh, opening their eyes to how dangerous um, this is uh, and the threat that it poses uh, to all of us. It, if, as many people would like you to be, uh, you end up being vice president to President Trump, uh, I mean, first of all, would you accept the job if you were offered it? I would. I would. I'd, I'd be honoured to serve uh, my country in that way. There's so many challenges that we're facing here at home, domestic policies and domestic issues, there are obviously many challenges in the foreign policy front. Uh, when you look at conflicts and wars or proxy wars, uh, new cold wars that are being uh, escalated and, and waged in different regions in the world, multiple regions of the world, we're on the brink of World War III and never been closer to, to the possibility of a nuclear war. Uh, you know, with Putin just talking yesterday or the day before about his uh, planning drills for the use of tactical nuclear weapons. We are facing uh, a serious crisis on so many fronts. Uh, I'd be honored to be in a position to start to tackle these challenges and to get our country back on track 
and and take the experience that I have, peers, of, of having worked in Washington for so long, of understanding not only how the system is supposed to work, but understanding how both on the political front, from a politician and elected leader standpoint, but also when you look in our bureaucracies and kind of the administrative state, how laws are essentially being passed through administrative rules instead of going through our legislative process as they are supposed to, it's going to take people with courage and a backbone and experience to be able to go in and actually start to fix things and get us back to where we need to be. I mean, talking of people who need courage and a backbone, uh, you might have to have a difficult conversation with President Trump if he looks you in the eye and says, well, Tulsi, do you think I had the 2020 election stolen? Yes or no? There's so much that went into the rigging of that 2020 election that started in 2016. So I think when, when whether it's he or others are looking at what happened in 2020, uh, what I and I talk about this in the book is how investigations were launched based on no evidence, claims about Russian interference that were funded by Hillary Clinton. These things began during the 2016 election and they didn't stop after he won. They continued throughout the, his presidency in what was essentially this slow rolling um, coup that was trying to make him impotent as a president and unable to carry out uh, the things that he ran on. And, you know, look, there, I'm, there were things I agreed on, things I disagreed on. That's not really the point here. The point is that in the protection of our democracy, we can't have people politicizing and weaponizing our own government to try to manipulate the outcome of the election and not respect the wishes of the American people. But I would agree with you about the Russia collusion bullshit, which is what it was. I called that at the start. I called it during. I called it at the end. I thought the suppression of the New York Post story about Hunter Biden's laptop was an outrage uh, and a clear partisan outrage. There are many things I'm sure that I would agree with you about. But when I sat with President Trump uh, for this, this show and I said to him, look, there's just no actual evidence that in, in, to his central claim that there was vote rigging which cost him the election, that has not been proven. And, and we now know that is not the case. You know, you've had many Republican judges conclude the same thing. And I, people will ask you, they'll say, come on, Tulsi, you're a smart person. You've had a very wide and varied career. You must accept, or maybe you don't, but I'll give you the chance to clarify, you must accept that on that, President Trump is simply wrong. The election was not stolen by vote rigging. There are other arguments that there was a narrative about Russia and about laptops and so on, which had an adverse effect, and I totally accept that, but not on the vote rigging. Do you accept that? Yeah, I, and I think those issues that we're talking about, those bigger issues, should, should be more of a focus and more of a concern because they had, they had a much greater impact. I, I have not seen uh, the evidence uh, that, that uh, you're talking about with regard to the 2020 election day results itself. But I also think it's important to point out that there are uh, valid concerns about election integrity that need to be addressed. Uh, when I was in Congress and I lived in Washington, D.C., uh, every, election, every election day that came around, we, we bought the, our house from a, an estate. Uh, the, the former owners had passed away. And, and, uh, and so every election day that came around, two years, four years, six years after we'd already been living there, um, we got absentee ballots for the former owners who had passed away mm. many years before. It would have been very easy to fill out those ballots and send them in. So when people, I, I just I think it's important to point this out, that when people raise concerns around the integrity of our elections, they should not be so easily dismissed. I introduced legislation when I was in Congress that would have mandated the use of paper ballots or an, a, a verifiable paper backup if you're using an electronic, a cold electronic mm -hmm. system not connected to the internet in any way. Unfortunately, leaders in Congress on both sides, they they were unwilling to take action that would direct states to provide this auditable paper trail to ensure that we can increase the confidence of voters, that the vote that they are casting is the vote that's being I mean, a system, counted. A system can always be improved, but the American electoral system is actually, I would argue, the most secure in the world and the best in the world. Uh, obviously, everything can be improved. But I also think you talk about integrity of elections. It's also important, I think, for any presidential candidate in America or someone aspiring as you did to be vice president of the country, that you've got to accept the peaceful transfer of power. 
you have to accept when you've lost. You know, one of my big frustrations yes, with Donald Trump is that uh, there are many qualities that Donald Trump has. Uh, he's got an unbelievable thick skin to better soak up all this stuff and keep powering on. I've never seen anything quite like it. Um, a lot of the policy stuff he did I thought was very effective. Uh, a lot of the rhetoric, less so, but he would argue, well, that's part of what he is, and I get that. Uh, but on this stolen election thing, uh, which led, of course, to the terrible scenes on January the 6th and so on. It is incumbent, isn't it, on all candidates and all people who want to be president or vice president that you accept the result of an election? It is, and it is also incumbent upon... Uh, we have systems in place. Uh, if, if you have concerns about the validity of the outcome of, of a, a vote count in a certain state, there are systems in place, as there should be, to ensure that those votes that uh, were cast are actually being counted accurately. So, uh, you know, the, the question being posed right now is, you know, to Donald Trump and to others, will you accept the outcome of, of the 2024 election? It's legitimate to say, well, yes. However, if there are concerns, we have a system in place to check those concerns. And when those checks and balances have been done, the people's voices have been heard and you accept the outcome of that election. Yes, I'm glad you said that. A uh, couple of uh, questions before I let you go. I know you, you've been on one of the world's greatest book tours. You must be completely exhausted. First of all, the stamina required to be a top politician in America. You know, you've been in war zones, literally. Um, does it compare to that? <laughs> it's, com it's completely different. Um, you know, it, it, it's different to operate in a war zone with fellow service members and people who you know and literally trust with your life, uh, all working together towards that common cause to accomplish that mission and that task at hand, all wearing the same American flag on our uniform. It's a very different kind of uh, pressure, I suppose you could say, an environment here in American politics where, uh, unfortunately, it's, it's difficult to find people who you can trust and it's difficult to find politicians who aren't making their decisions based solely on their political ambition or their partisan interests, who are actually committed every day in a real way of putting our country and in the interests of the American people first. That, that's one of the problems with our political system uh, in the way that it is. And, and it's what I encourage people to do. Look at the issues. Look at look at where your candidates uh, stand on these issues and make those informed decisions accordingly. One of the things in the book which I passionately disagree with you about is Ukraine. I've been there, I've interviewed President Zelensky. Um, and I'm just surprised, I've been very surprised that a significant number of Republicans in the last two years have gravitated to a position, it seems to me, of saying, we should just let Putin take what he's taken. He should keep it. Uh, we should end this war by allowing him to keep all the land he's stolen with his murderous, illegal rampage of a sovereign democratic European country. I never thought I'd hear Republicans make that argument. You yourself were in Iraq. You were there, actually, I think, at the same time as my brother, who was a, a colonel in the Royal Welsh Regiment. Um, so thank you for your service, as I always thank him for his. But you were in Iraq, which, you know, just to remind viewers, was a war that was fought on an entirely false pretext, as it turned out, that Saddam Hussein had weapons of mass destruction. Um, here, you've got someone who absolutely has weapons of mass destruction, Vladimir Putin. He's, he's a ruthless Russian dictator. He's illegally invaded a democratic country. And I, I'm baffled why people like you on the right, on uh, the Republican side of this argument, seem to think it would be, by default, really, uh, a, a good thing or a thing that has to happen, inevitable thing to happen, that Putin wins? Uh, I don't think that's an accurate characterization at all. Of course, it was wrong for Putin to uh, invade Ukraine. My criticism of our American policy and the Biden-Harris administration's leadership is on this, that they, they, they should see the situation for what it is, not what they wished it to be. They should clearly have defined what does winning look like. If you ask 10 different people in, in Washington, D.C., this question, you'll get 10 different answers. You'll get different answers from the State Department versus our Department of Defense. You'll even get different answers within 
the White House. All they say is, well, we will be there for as long as it takes. We will spend as much uh, hundreds of billions or trillions of dollars of American taxpayer dollars, uh, whatever it takes, as long as it takes, but not defining what that is. And peers, it, it is because of my experience serving in different war zones in the military that I know that there are very simple questions that need to be asked and answered before committing American taxpayer dollars uh, and, and our support to go and intervene. What is our objective? What are we trying to accomplish? How does it serve the best national interests of the American people and our own country's security? What President Biden should have done from the very beginning was exercised his leadership to get uh, Putin and Zelensky or their representatives across the table from each other to broker a peace deal. Uh, the, the details to say, well, we're just gonna be in this until you know, Zelensky's standard, which is they get every inch of Ukrainian territory back. How many Ukrainian lives are going to be sacrificed in the process? Yeah, hang on, hang on, Tulsi. As, as, I just as want to laudable jump in on that. as that goal is, Piers. Right, on that point, let me ask you, if this was an attack on American soil, you would want every single inch that was taken by Russia or whoever it may be back. You And you would join the fight to do it because you've served your country. And you would be absolutely outraged. Of, of, of course, but, but, yeah, but this hang is on. not... But this, this is this how is you... Not, you can't make... Yeah, but that's how Ukrainians feel about their land. They feel exactly the same way that it. you would or I would about our land. I, I understand the feeling. The feeling and the emotion is very different from the reality that Ukraine is facing a much larger country with a much greater military force, with many more people and its own military industrial complex that has been able to reconstitute its hardware and its weapon systems far more quickly than even our American intelligence agencies uh, thought that they would be able to. And oh, by the way, Putin also has both tactical and strategic nuclear weapons. There's a long history here, and I know you've gone into this with different guests over yeah. time. We won't get into it now. But my view on foreign policy, I'm not an isolationist, I'm not a pacifist, I'm a realist. And understanding that it is not doing any good for the Ukrainian people to, and I've been to Ukraine many times. Like you, I have many friends there. And it's heartbreaking to see what they are going through. Continuing to fuel a war of attrition where you don't have a, a uh, it's not a peer-to-peer -peer war that is going on there and an unwillingness by our leaders to be honest with the American people about, number one, how, mu how much further are we going to go into debt to go and fuel this proxy war? And number two, the reality and the honesty of the fact that as tensions continue to increase, we are pushing us closer to the possibility, whether intentionally or unintentionally, of, of a nuclear war being sparked off. The best thing would be, and, and our military leaders have said this for quite some time, the only way this war ends is through a brokered uh, treaty, some kind of agreement where both parties are, are gonna walk away not happy. My position has been consistent throughout that this should have been done as quickly as possible after this war broke out, which could have saved uh, so many people's lives uh, and, and, uh, and cost. Let me end, if I may, with a very difficult question, uh, because you're up against other people to be potential vice president, one of whom is Christy Noem, who's just got a new book out too. Uh, and my difficult question is this, is, is Tulsi Gabbard, have you ever killed a dog? <laughs> no, unequivocally. <laughs> Do you, no. think, do you think <laughs> killing dogs and then boasting about it in your book disqualifies you to be a potential VP? Uh, you know, look, I, I've known Christy for a, a long time. We served in Congress together. Uh, I haven't spoken to her about this. I've, I've heard her argument for it. She made the decision to put this story in her book. Um, she's talking about it. There are other things that are coming out in the news about it. Um, look, she she is uh, she's an adult. She's a former member of Congress. She's the governor of one of our 50 states. Uh, she has the opportunity to make her case to the American people. You haven't actually answered that question. What's that? Well, you haven't answered my question, whether it's disqualifying to go around murdering dogs. 
I think the Ameri no, I, I think I think the American people really that is my answer to your question. <laughs> that this is this is my point. Voters get to choose. Voters get to choose. I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't go and kill a puppy named Cricket. I just wouldn't do it. <laughs> you know, I think you can do many things as a politician in America, but you can't kill dogs because uh, the, the people won't wear it. Uh, Tulsi Gabbard, really enjoyed the book. I actually always enjoy you on the airwaves. I think you're one of the more intelligent, thoughtful and eloquent people in American politics. And I've watched your journey with great interest. Uh, so thank you for coming on Uncensored. I appreciate it. Thank you, Piers. Look forward to meeting you in person. I would love that. Thank you very much. Thank you.